Çıktı. Auzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve salatu ve selamu ala khayri halqi ve nuri arşi afdalil anbiyai vel mursalin habibina ve seyyidina ve sanadina ve şefi'ina ve mevlana abil qasim muhammed. Ve ala alihi et tayyibin et tahirin el ma'asumin el mazlumin. Sallallahu aleyke ya aba abdillah. وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك وجدك وأبيك وأمك وأخيك وتسعة المعصومين من ذريتك وبنيك ورحمة الله وبركاته. I begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, and I send greetings to the Shuhada of Karbala for their valor. their strength, their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for being an excellent role model for us to follow. I'm honored to be alive, I'm honored to exist, I'm honored to have been given this opportunity to not only exist under the domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is the greatest honor but to recognize these great personalities who gave their souls for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All these nights when I've been talking with regards to different issues pertaining to how we need to abstain from evil and promote good and to love Allah and all these different examples that we give, this is all under this principle of jihad, which is struggle. And struggle is a very common word, but the parameters under the struggle <clears throat> that we need to understand is based on this individual aspect of understanding what does it mean to be patient, what does it mean to love Allah, what does it mean to have a vision, what does it mean to believe in the day of judgment, what does it mean to obey the messenger of Allah, what does it mean to obey those who come after the messenger of Allah, the ones who are the ulil amri min kum that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states in the Quran. All of these aspects that we discuss all come under the jurisdiction of jihad also because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to struggle in all the different levels of our existence. As we know, Allah has blessed us with four faculties. Quwa, as we call it. One is quwate aqaliya, which is the faculty of intellect. The other is quwate ghadabiyya, which is the faculty of anger being em <clears throat> empowered with an aggressive nature which makes us want to do things. Quwate shahwiya, which is uh, a quality that we possess, which is desire, greed, lust, wants. We want things. It's known as quwate shahwiya. And quwate wahmiya, which is the power of intellect, not intellect, but vision, imagination. The ability to imagine things. That means that when we talk about universal laws, for example, when we talk about goodness, generosity, kindness, mercy. These are universal principles. If not for this faculty of quwate wahmiya, we would not be able to understand that. And of these four faculties, the most powerful one that must rule the other three, it is quwate aqaliyya, the faculty of aql, which is intellect. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The faculty of intellect is the faculty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in its essence, aql was the first thing Allah created in this universe, one of the first things. And he endowed it with many characteristics, positive characteristics, meaning the 75 armies, according to Al-Kafi, that these 75 armies of patience, forbearance, justice, kindness, shuja'at, strength, you know, rising for justice, all the qualities that we see that are positively uh, achievable in our characteristic, 
you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed it in aql. And aql is really the heart of all movements. And even when I take this leap of faith where I cry for Allah, you know, for example, when I cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or I cry about Karbala, or I cry for this injustice that took place, it's all driven by aql. Because aql gives what we call this platform to, to jump off from. For example, when it comes to religion, you find there are people who practice religion blindly. They have a great passion for their God. They have a great passion for their Lord. They love their God, but they don't know why they love their God. Our Christian brethren, for example, to give you an example, and it's not only in Christianity, it's even in Islam and other faith, but to give you an example, when Christians love Jesus السلام, as their savior, that's a relationship they have, but the minute a Muslim typically meets a Christian and says, tell me how did Jesus become son of God, you find they have a problem rationalizing it because the element of logic is weak. They cannot. They cannot rationalize the deity of a man. They cannot rationalize that a man can be God, but they just say, well, it is, and that's what it is like, and that's how we believe, and we're going to believe in it. It's my faith at the end of the day that saves me and I'm just going to follow my faith. A Muslim typically will ask, no, I will not accept this unless you can prove to me that Allah or God can have a son from the scriptures and from rationality, I'm not interested. As a result, what you find is that to the believer in Christianity, they have faith, but it's called blind faith. They took a leap of faith without any logic, logical foundation, but it was just said to them that you will be saved through vicarious atonement of Jesus' crucifixion on the cross, and therefore you are saved on the day of judgment, and that's the end of the story. Whereas for a Muslim, we take leaps, and that leap is simple. Similar analogy I give you. One cannot take a leap if the ground is not firm. One cannot take a leap on quicksand. If the ground is soft, if it's murky ground as we say, if it's not firm ground, you can't take a leap. It's impossible. You cannot take a leap of faith on murky ground. But when your ground is solid, there's one thing. But then when it's bouncy, it gives you even a bigger leap. No one has the bouncy kind of substance like the lovers of Ahlul Bayt. No one has the firmness of the ground. Not only that, but the platform is filled with potential movements where it takes you in good directions, where now I can have a leap of faith towards that which I believe in because the ground which I stood on pushed me in the right direction. That leap of faith has to have a foundation. And this is where the aql comes into play, which is the foundation of all foundations. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us examples. For example, I've used this example before, but I think it's good to re repeat it. You find that when Adam alayhi salam, after he was placed on this earth, Jibra'il comes to him and asks him that Allah has offered you three things. Take one of them only. He says either deen, aql, or haya. Three things, meaning deen, I mean, aql, deen, or haya? Your intellect, your way of life, or your ethics, you know, your haya. Which one do you want? And Adam, as a messenger of Allah, as a prophet of Allah, has already been taught the secrets of life. Quran is clear about that. So Adam already knows what it means to be a representative of God on this earth. He's not blind, he is not slipping and sliding and making mistakes. No. And Adam replies that I want aql. He says to Jibrail, give me aql. This is a metaphor, but the metaphor is very deep for you and I to understand as a lesson in life. That when we talk about events in Karbala or whatever, when you see a young child being massacred in Karbala, like Qasim ibn al-Hassan is the one we're going to commemorate tonight, and Aun and Muhammad, the children of Zainab alayhi salam and Abdullah ibn Jafar, who was her husband, when we talk about these people and when we reference it and understand 
14 centuries ago. How does a child manage to do this? You understand that there is that element of aql, there's that element of leap that's very deep that you and I need to understand. So Adam says, I want aql. Jibreel says to Deen and Haya, leave. Allah has commanded the two of you to leave. Go. And they reply, this is a metaphor, they reply that no, we cannot leave. Jibreel asks, why can you not leave? They say, Allah has commanded us, Deen and Haya, to remain wherever there is aql. So wherever there is aql, we must be. The implication therefore is that my religion is complete. When I'm using the intellect properly and I'm well grounded, what will happen is my religion will perfect itself because now I will follow the prescriptions of Allah logically and rationally. And my ethics will be complete because now everything comes into proper focus. Therefore, my behavior, my halal, my haram, and my characteristic becomes complete because aql is driving the entire sphere of my existence. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to utilize and understand. I will, I'm briefly touching this subject tonight. As you've heard of the hadith, the messenger has said that man arafa nafsa faqad arafa rabba. The one who knows himself will know his Lord, indeed will know his Lord. So we need to utilize our opportunities that we have to know ourselves. There is nothing better than introspection. That is why the messenger of Allah said one hour of meditation is better then the entire night of prayer not with thought in it. Meaning if a person ritually does salah and does tasbih all the time, but they don't think and reflect and connect with Allah. You know sometimes when you're praying, suddenly you get this feeling, there's a presence, you feel a divine presence. And when you're reading a Quran, a Quran for example, when Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ تِبَاقَ you see the whole universe in front of you. you, you see yourself in it, you see your uh, movement in it, you see your purpose in it, you see your goals in it, you see everything in a flash. And by the way, seeing that is very possible. Researchers have shown people who are falling from high places or they're about to die, they see their whole past in one second. They see their whole life in one second. They see their childhood, their middle age, their old age, whatever age they've been up to. They see everything in one second, one flash. Everything appears in front of them. It's very possible to have those moments where Allah exposes the inner secrets of our existence in a second. It's possible. So when you're reading this Quran, it's so beautiful how it touches your heart. You find that moment of connection, Allah has given you a response. And He's touched your heart. And he's asking you, do you see it? So this, this nafs, when it's introspective and when it feels that, that one second of feeling, I tell you, lingers for the rest of your life. I've had those moments, and I'm sure many of you have had it, where you wake up at Fajr Salah, and you read Quran secretly, and you're begging Allah to make your life successful, because the world is filled with evil and problems. And you're begging him. You're begging him to perfect you. You're begging him to improve you. You're begging him to protect you. And you get into that, that zone where everything appears in front of you. Well, that's it right there. That's a moment of reflection. It's deep. It's so deep that the rest of your life you could be driven. That you see the same person doing philanthropic work, building masajid, running madrasas, constantly sweeping floors at the Husseiniya and doing things and helping people, going to orphans and giving them their needs and, and saving you know, women who have, been, uh, who have lost their husbands and protecting families. You say, where do you get this energy? It could have been that one moment that touched them so much that that moment of reflection was so real. That's why the messenger said, one hour of reflection is better than an entire nightly prayer without thought. As in Al-Kafi, it's very clear that this individual who was praying so much that the person goes, the neighbor goes to Imam Jafar Sadiq salam and says to him, my neighbor prays a lot. He prays a lot. What's his reward on judgment day? The Imam asks the most important question. 
how much does this individual know what he's doing? And the neighbor says, he's not very learned. He's not very deep in his ability to understand. He's just a ritualist. He does it because he feels it's important to do it. The imam replies, and his reward is based on his understanding. And if it is little, his reward is little. The companion says, though he prays so much, imam says, yes. That's why I say to us all, brothers and sisters, that when we get together for these gatherings, many a times when you read the world of our Shia brothers around the world who love Imam Hussein, many just want to come, make us cry, let us go home and forget about the whole thing. Let us do our tributes to Imam Hussein alayhi salam and don't tell us about our problems. Don't tell us to change our characters. Don't tell us about what we have as a problem. Don't tell us about our abuses in our society. Don't tell us about our problems with our children. Don't tell us that we are wrong as parents. Don't tell us. Honestly, I say this is the truth. But by the grace of Allah, the new modern generation that's coming around now, by Allah's grace, having seen the dynamics of this world, is changing in that perspective. It says, no. Tell us about why I need to cry. I remember in Michigan last year when I was lecturing, an amazing event took place. A young boy came to me and says, with all due respect, my respected brother, I am not convinced about crying. And this business that you people cry, he says, I'm a Shia, but I'm not convinced. And don't tell me about crying. I'm not convinced. You have to tell me the real reason, otherwise I'm not interested in coming here. I looked at him and I said, sit, listen, and you'll hear something. Come with a clean heart and you will hear something. That boy came to me and says, I've never cried more in my life than I've cried that night. Did I make him cry? Was that my intent? To make him cry? No. Expose the truth. Expose the beauty of Allah. Expose the true nature of the reality. And let the individual cry. But that exposition of crying is not a ritual form of crying. It's real. It's with understanding that when someone is reading this ayah, as I mentioned in Surah Al-Mulk, hmm? you begin to shiver, quiver. You don't see any incongruity in Allah's creation. Look again. Futur? Do you see any cracks? Then turn again and look again. You will come back dazzled and tired. You quiver. You shiver. And you are in touch. And you want to go on to sujood. You want to put your face on the ground. You are in love. You are in awe. It's amazing how much we worship. As we say, idol worshipping when we look at Hollywood stars. Even among our own communities, when we see somebody is a superstar. We even, if say this is his scarf, people pay thousands of dollars to get a scarf of somebody. Isn't it? Idol worshipping, low level of idol worshipping. We love it. You see a superstar, let's say a famous soccer player signs something, his signature sometimes is worth millions. Just a signature. How much value do we put into it? Hmm? It's an amazing, isn't it? It's an amazing reality that when a person is a superstar, he puts a signature somewhere, everybody wants a piece of it. It's a real one. Or the one that won the, 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 the grand you know, finale, whatever, Super Bowl in America. We want it. Now imagine when you recognize Allah's creation and you are in awe of the master of all that's created, how would you feel? If we put millions of dollars worth of value in a signature of an individual who is, who is dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has no idea what will happen to them the next day, what about the one who created the universe? What about that one? Do you have an awe of that one? Do you turn to that one? Do you turn, do you go with submission when Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Indeed, successful is the believer, the one who goes into prayer in salah with khushu, khashi'un, their heart palpitates. Do we have that? You think it's easy to get that? People ask, how do I get that? I said, we're all struggling to get it. It's not an easy thing. Believe me, it's not an easy thing. Don't think that you just wake up one morning without any effort that you get it. No, 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 no. The value of Allah to come towards Him is a struggle. It's the greatest struggle in the world. That's why the Messenger of Allah says, no one has struggled. No one has suffered the way I have suffered. Why? Because he's suffering towards the greatest. He's the greatest. And he's reaching the greatest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I tell you brothers and sisters, we need to reflect on this. If we reflect on this properly, and we dissect ourselves mentally, 
and see what is my value, this introspection, this aql that Allah has endowed me with, that my ibadah, what does it mean for me to do what I'm doing? And then you take this leap and you cry and you move the momentum. Subhanallah, it's unstoppable as they say. It's indomitable. No one can stop you. Bombs can drop. You won't stop you. Your love is too much. It's like that vision I see of a person who just won, for example, the, the, the final game in tennis and he sees his coach or his father up there because that was his inspiration. And there are thousands of people, they want to take this superstar now. They want to touch him and he ignores them and he just keeps moving towards his vision. But it's up there on the bleachers. It's on the third floor. He says, I don't care. I'm going up there. He says, how? It's too high. He climbs up. Everybody wants to touch him. He ignores them. They're stopping him. He ignores them. He keeps moving. His vision is up there. This is life, brothers and sisters. That when you love Allah, you find all these trials and tribulations on this earth is nothing to stop you. It's constant. You're moving. You keep moving towards Allah and you have no, you have no remorse whatsoever. You are constantly moving. You're in love with your Lord. That moment of reflection in its pinnacle is in Karbala. It's in its pinnacle. Because when you examine outside of this vision and see a desert, hot desert, seventh night, water stops, the army of Yazid is vicious, slick. Every word you say, they twist it. They're trick, full of trickery, mean, hungry for power, wealthy. They use their money. And on this side is a pure group of people. Purists, just like ashab -e kaf the people of the cave, pure. They don't want to worship idols. They do not want to submit to wrong. They love Allah. They want to be purified. They truly believe in Qad uh, Mu'minun. They truly, they are, these are the true Mu'minun. They are khushu. As Allah said, Qad aflaha man zakkaha. Indeed, successful is the one who purifies. They want to purify. They don't want impurity. Everything comes their way. They said, move it away. No. I'm moving towards my beloved. I'm in love. It's like when a husband is in love with his wife and he works extra time, extra hours. You say, what are you doing? He says, I'm in love. He says, why are you doing this? He says, I want to please my wife. When you're in love, that rationale at a certain level stops. Where you can no longer give rationale. But don't believe that that rationale is false. It's, it's a firm rationale that's built on the foundation of aql. That when the husband is struggling, or the wife is struggling, she cooks at home and prepares the house after a lot of difficulty, all day. Why are you doing this? It's because I'm in love with my husband. Or when the child goes out of his way to please his mother or father. You say, why are you doing this? Forget it. He said, no, I'm in love. I love my mother. I love my father. I'll give my life, my soul for them because I love them. That love is a dimension, subhanallah. It's very difficult to explain it. One must experience it. But that experience comes when you see this vision. And when the vision is there, and it all fits into a focus. Not the false kind of love, but the real kind. The one that I mentioned the other day, when Umm Wahhab and her husband, they're in love with each other. But they're in love with Allah. And they haven't lost focus of their Imam. And they haven't lost focus of their duty. That they leave Kufa. They come forward. They escape. They find avenues. You know, one would say a little, a little blockage. Okay, maybe Allah doesn't want me to go there. Sometimes we want to do a good thing. The minute we stand up, you know, something is on our floor. Oh, it's on my way. Maybe Allah doesn't want me to go there. So you sit down. No, not that type. The one who is being blockaded in every way, but is looking, running, finding, looking, because they're in love. I would love for us all. I tell you, this love does not come for easy. It comes as a result of introspection and reflection. That when an individual understands who they are, understands their capacities, that these four faculties need to be controlled. This power of lust, which is a great power given unto us, the passion. Power of passion, it's beautiful. It's a gift. That when you love someone passionately, it's an amazing power. It's the most incredible power. But unfortunately, shaitan abuses it. That a young child starts with his beauty, doesn't go out there and have a good time. And he keeps messing around on the internet and chatting with all types of people, doesn't even know. They get hurt. They put their trust. A young child puts their trust on someone. But the, other, on the other, person on the other side is an abuser. And this child thinks that they found their love. 
And then they get abused. And the child closes up and finds out, oh, that was very painful. And then they try again because their passions take them further. And again they get bitten. And then they get enclosed again. And then again they get bitten. And they keep getting bitten. Eventually when they are ready to settle down, they don't trust anybody. That when they want to get married, when a girl wants to get married, she's going to ask for an exorbitant da dowry because that's her insurance policy. She's already worried about the divorce already. And the boy's already worried about his divorce too. Because no one trusts anybody. It's become a system where this passion and desire, that we placed rahma, mawadda, and of his signs he made mates from among yourselves. And he put mercy and mutual love between the two of you. These are signs for people who think, who reflect, but rather we abuse. So our four powers that Allah has given it, one of them is quwate, shahwiya, it's so abused that by the time the young boys and the girls are ready to get married, it's the hardest thing to find the right sp uh, potential spouse. Because so many baggages come because the society is tuned that way. The society is reckless in its immorality. The society doesn't care. In fact, the society finds Islam to be a threat precisely for this reason. Because the society sees that Islam is abstemious at that level. Islam is a religion that is preventive more than it looks towards cure. Although Islam is a religion of cure. But Islam uh, adheres to the, the common adage in the, in, uh, the universal law that prevention is better than cure. Islam adheres to this principle. Prevention is better than cure. Because what good is cure when you've already been hurt? Now cure is there in Islam of course. But prevention is better. Especially in certain matters. Like love relations. Social relations. If you're not careful, the minute you get torn in that level, you never trust people. Your psychology always gets changed. And it comes back to linger at you. Constant. No matter what you do, it comes back and it lingers at you. You could be married and had, a, had a, a past event that hurt you. And the minute any resemblance of that appears in your relationship with the person you love, it will distract you. And it may bring back old thoughts. And that may take you off track. But a person who's in love, truly in love, and understands the dynamics of love, even if they were hurt, when they grab onto the rope of Allah firmly, and they understand the dynamics and all these little, little things that appear, they're able to forego. But my advice to us all, and I know you know this, is our children should be trained at an early age to keep a chaste life. As much as the society is out there, and as much as a child comes and says, look, my desires are very strong. Take these desires, I say to my young brothers and sisters, and move it in a different direction. Get into sports. Get into social activities. Become productive, creative. There are many ways to distract oneself. It's a matter of distraction. The problem is it's very hard to be distracted in the societies. The minute you walk out, all the billboards are telling you focus this way. It's hard. It's very hard to be distracted from your passionate desires. Very hard. This is where Quran comes in. This is where Ahlul Bayt comes in. This is where our family comes in. This is where we need to create schools and environments and camps for our children and social environments that are protective enough that our children don't fall into these traps. Otherwise, for sure, these four powers will be abused, particularly the Quwwat al-Shahwiyah and Quwwat al-Ghadabiyah. These two are the most abused in society. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we need to understand, brothers and sisters, our obligations and responsibility. And tonight, we dedicate tonight's lecture to the youth of the world. Because I'm going to commemorate the youth of the world in Karbala. Because in Karbala, there were all types of representatives. There were the old people, the middle-aged, the young, and the very young. Men and women, male and female, all of them were there. They were all being represented in Karbala. There's not a single person on earth who was not represented. A white man, a black man, a brown man, a yellow man. All of them, men and women, all were covered. All were represented in Karbala. So tonight we dedicate that for the sake of saving the children and our youth, brothers and sisters. We need to be proactive. We need to save our children, our programs. These kinds of programs should be geared to save our next generation. Let's not take 
our rituals as priority at the cost of losing our children. It's sad that sometimes we don't even provide programs for our children because we're so busy reenacting our old baggage that we, were, that we came from our countries from, that we want those and our children can't even connect because they're in a different generation, in a different culture. They cannot even understand what is going on and they're left to dangle outside and the parents say, it's okay, we're doing something for Allah. Allah says, what happened to your aql? What happened to your common sense that you're losing generations, hundreds of them being found in pubs and doing the worst things out there in society? What happened to you? How can you take a lover of Ahlul Bayt and put him in those kinds of societies when you were chosen to be leaders for the rest of the world, not to be followers and to, and to assimilate into these rotten societies out there that are immoral? Morality, brothers and sisters. That's the flag of Islam. When we talk about hijab, why is hijab so important in Islam? Why is it so attacked in the world today? Because every other religion has abandoned their morality at this level. Hijab is the flag of Islam. Sisters, I say this to you, and the brothers too. All of us, our eyes are hijab. The sisters wearing this garb, the way we dress in public, is our hijab. Modesty, chastity, but not the extreme form. Extreme form is not in Islam. You'll find in Islam, everything in Islam is moderation, not extremism. You don't need to cover yourself completely with the face and all of that. Or you find some people wearing a three-quarter dishdasha because that's what the Prophet wore and then you got to have a miswak in your hand and you got to have a long beard and you got some rice stuck in there because that's how it's supposed to be. No. We're not archaic old people. We're modern. We're adaptive. The Quran is not an archaic book. It's a book filled with morals and principles. It's timeless. Timelessness is what we're talking about. We are adaptive. We can be fashionable. We can look good. We can do everything in moderation. We look good, but we are also morally attractive. That when a child who is a non-Muslim sees you and says, that's morality, that's decency. I remember in one camp when we went, there was an uh, a Greek chef. He and his daughter, I distinctly remember, and our sisters went to the camp with us because when we go to camps, we take women, brothers and sisters together. And all our sisters wear full hijab. They play their own sports. They do everything because we believe men and women should be given that opportunity. Boys and girls should be given the opportunity to express the beauty of this world within the injunctions and prescriptions of Islam. There's not a problem. So while our sisters are running around playing volleyball and so on, the chef is observing them. We went there for four days. On the third day, he said to me, he's sitting with me and we need not speak a word about Islam. He just knew that these are Muslims. He was the chief chef of the entire crew. And we were controlling him, what should be done, and we were basically working with him to prepare our own food. But he was so impressed with us, he says to me, he says, I've been observing you for three days. And I noticed your women, the way they move in this camp facility. I am so impressed with you all, that this to me is a woman. There was a sister passing by, he says, that to me is a woman, that's a woman. I said, really? What do you mean? He said, that's a woman to me. She is dignified. Look at her. She is dignified. Then he looks at the window, and Allah is my witness. There was a woman walking with a t-shirt, very exposed. She says, that to me is not decency. That's decency to me, he says. Then he sat after half an hour, he says, I'm very concerned about my own future. I want to be a Muslim. If this is the true religion, and don't think I haven't studied, I've been watching, and I've watched you people how you work, and I like your moderation, I love what you do, and I'd like to do shahada today. And he did his shahada, and he prayed dhuhr salah with us, and he brought his daughter, young, beautiful girl, and he put a hijab on her, and called her Zainab. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Can you imagine, at the, what does it take? What does it take to change a man and a woman on the, in this society if it's not with the way we behave with ourselves, with modesty and decency? Now ask a child, all of us, you know, people come to me and say, brother, I, I'm very much, I really want to date this girl, I really like her, what do you think, huh? I mean, after all, I'm a boy, you know, I've got all these powers in me, you know, it's got so much hormones and it's hard to control myself. I ask him, I say, do you have a sister? He says, yeah. I said, when you date this girl, do you mind if your sister dates somebody else with you? He says, I'll kill him. I said, oh, you can take somebody else's sister, but your sister can't go with anybody? How's that? Hmm? 
He says, I'll kill him. I said, you're right. What you say is right. You feel that passion, don't you? He said, yeah. I said, back off. Back off. When it's time for you to spend time with another woman, Allah has opened channels for you to do it the halal way. And Allah will never deny you that lust and passion, trust me. And he will bring it to its completion and fruition that you will smile every time you think about it. But you need to be patient. You need to work towards it. It doesn't come for free. You can't be dangling on the streets that every child is told, listen, you're not getting married right now. Have a good time. When you're ready to get married, we'll worry about your nikah and stuff. No. You plan it at an early age. These young children need to be taught that your preparation is for that day when you find your perfect spouse so that you start a new generation so that the parents are proud to see their son and their daughter is getting married to the right person and the right children come out of it with decency that when you look at a child what makes a child strong in his morality it's when he looks at his mother and his mother is full of honor and decency the women of Karbala were women with honor and decency that's how I see it that when I look at them when I see Zainab a woman filled with power that she stands in front of Yazid and calls him Yabna Talaqi, oh you son of a freed slave. She says, you've cut our limbs, but we are grateful to Allah. And we haven't lost anything. Wow, what an answer. A woman dignified, the mother, the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. This is the kind of emulation we need to have. When we look at the Fatima Zahra, her wisdom is so immense. That even students in the house of today, they study her khutbah, they cannot understand the depth of what she's saying. That's her intellectual power. We need to bring this forward among our women. We need our women to become the, some of the uh, speakers, public presenters among the sisters. How many do we have? How many English speakers do we have? How many of us are on this front line? A few of us are being shared across the globe. That's not acceptable. I'm sorry. It's not acceptable. And we're going to change that inshallah. We need to have an army of presenters of different qualities bringing Islam on the front lines. And this new generation of young generations are intellectually endowed with much understanding. They just need a little guidance and push. And you'll be surprised what they're capable of doing. They can speak with an English accent. They've got the charisma, the style, and they've been raised in a Western society. So they can, they can respond in a different way. And they can present Islam to the Western world in a different way. We need this. This is my point that I'm saying. That brothers and sisters, we have been blessed with this great religion that is ethically so sound and morally so firm that let's be its true representatives and let's not fool ourselves into falling into these traps. I know I'm speaking generally tonight. But I'm reflecting on those youth as they're going to Karbala. I'm looking at Qasim ibn al-Hassan. I'm seeing his face in front of me. And I'm seeing it shining with love. Son of an imam. Beautiful. Full of akhlaq. That his mother was a, was a chast woman. Pure. Imam Hussein's wives. Look at them. Pure. What roles did they play? Subhanallah, it's so beautiful just to imagine that this is what we want. The world wants us to shatter this. The world wants us to efface this. The world wants our women to be effaced. People ask, why is the hijab on the woman and not on the man? The hijab is on the woman because she is the fabric of society. The new generations come from her. Children are born from women, not men. If a woman, the very place where the child plants itself in the womb of its mother, is tainted and made filthy, then the child will inherit some of that filth. It's a very important part of our existence. We don't realize this. Purity of a woman. When you see a woman, when she recites Quran, she is full of love for Allah and she's submissive to Allah. The way Quran is Surah Tahrim. Mu'minatin, qanitatin, salihatin, abidatin, sayyat. Allahu Akbar. When Allah is speaking at this level, you see a woman like that. Allah says, This is very important. Our women need to be elevated, pure, so that our children who come out are good naturally. That when they're here in the wombs of their mother, their mother and their father is reciting Quran. When their mother is abstaining from the haram, 
She's abstaining from eating haram food. She's abstaining from talking nonsense. She's abstaining from backbiting. She's abstaining from doing anything that Allah is not pleased with. The child benefits. We don't realize this. It's sad when we see couples get married. She's pregnant and they're fighting. Husband's hitting. Wife is kicking. What do you think the child is learning? You think he doesn't learn? Of course the child learns. The child is learning a lot in there. They have done studies that even parents who are very, very have an acute uh, sense of music, the child develops that acuity. That when he is born, he has an acute sense of musical instruments because he has heard it in the womb of his mother. So the environment of the child, as the child is being formed in the womb of the mother, Allah says in the Quran, that he shapes you in the womb of your mother the way he wills. That when he does that, there is a price to pay as parents, brothers and sisters. These young children, if they're not trained at an early age to look at their future, to look at the desire. Yes, you have a desire to be with a woman and a woman has a desire to be with a man. Yes, it's good. Nurture it. It's not haram. Nurture it. It's our, it is our right. To get married is the sunnah of the prophet. It's important that we merge these, these societies together positively. But when the children are born, when the mother becomes a mother, the woman becomes a mother, and the father becomes a father, he plays the fatherly responsibility that he's there to protect the child. And he's responsible that now that he has fathered a child, he plays that fatherly role. I see some of the fathers come and sit with their children. They bring their children, they sit with them. What an honor. It's so beautiful to see fathers who come and bring their children and they sit with them. What an honor. You come to listen to Majlis and your child sits next to you. What an honor. Or you bring your child forward and you keep him in the front and say, son, go listen forward. Or the mother is sitting there nurturing the child with difficulty. What an honor. The majlis of Imam Hussein is being brought and children are being brought so that they're nurtured positively. What an honor. Because we keep therefore them away from doing indecent things. After all, at the end of the day, the greatest message of Karbala was following that deen in Haya because Aqal was already complete. And Imam Hussein's activities, his akhlaq, was so profound, was so beautiful. Allahu Akbar. So brothers and sisters, please, there's much to say. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. I don't need to go into details. You know what I mean. Let us take that step. Allah will help us numerous times if we take the step. First step is to avoid the haram. In the ahkam al-khamsa, Wajib, haram, mustahab, makru, and mubah, you'll find wajib and haram are the two most important. And of these two, the haram is the most important. Avoid it. Whatever it is, if you believe truly this to be haram, stop it. Stop this drinking. Stop the drugs. Stop the backbiting. Stop the indecent behavior. Stop, stop, stop. You must stop. You might say, but my heart doesn't tell me. Allah says, well, you have to decide. If you have tawakkal in me, that you have to decide. I'm going to start an ayah of the Quran tonight, and inshallah I'll carry this over because my time is going to be up soon. In Surah Al-Anfal, this is one of my favorite verses in the Quran, besides all the rest of the verses. And I live by this verse. I love this verse because there is something special about it, but sometimes it's very hard to explain it in public. Where Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ This is just the first part. It's the eighth chapter, second verse. Beautiful verse, Surah Al-Anfal. Surely the believers are those. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ When they are reminded of Allah, when the talk of God comes into play, وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their heart palpitates. Why does it palpitate? Because Allah is the source of all good and the source of chastity, decency is Allah. That when I submit and I don't steal, I don't cheat, I keep my promise. يُوفُونَ بِالنَّظْرِ وَيَخَافُونَ Ahl al-Bayt, they keep their promise. They don't give false promises. They keep their promise. You're in love with Allah. You are aware of the Day of Judgment. Allah says their hearts palpitate. 
وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ Allah Akbar, it's so beautiful. Allah says, <clears throat> when the verses of the Quran are recited to them, زَادَتْهُمْ iman, Their iman increases. Their faith increases. They become pliant, cognizant, connected, in love. زَادَتْهُمْ iman. In the last verse, the last part, وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ and of their Lord, they have total trust. This tawakkal is the key to this whole thing. To have tawakkal al Allah is so important. Meaning you do everything tawakkal al Allah. Why? Because you're doing it for the pleasure of Allah. You wake up in the morning, you put your foot on the ground as Imam Ali alayhi salam. The minute Imam would open his eyes, he says, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al al azim. There is no might, authority, except Allah, the one. And he puts his foot on the ground, the right foot, and he begins his day thanking Allah for yet one more day to serve him. That's a love relationship. When you're in love with someone, you wake up in the morning, the first thing that you have is you think of the one you love. When you love someone, there's a great deal of pleasure when you think of the one you love. Tawakkal al Allah is a full motion of a person who's in love. Allah says, وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ In his Lord, he has total trust. Or in her Lord, they have total trust. Like for example, in Surah Al-Mulk, when the disbelievers are dangling, Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانُ آمَنَّ بِهِ وَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْنَ Say, the Lord is the one that I believe in. قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانُ آمَنَّ بِهِ It is my Lord, the Rahman, the merciful one that I have faith in. And in him, I have total trust. That means I wake up in the morning, I do things for the sake of Allah. That means I'm not going to do haram that day. For sure, if my day is truly tawakkal al Allah, I'm going to be cognizant of Allah, I will be the happiest that day, and I will commit the least sins that day. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Look at what Imam Ali alayhi salam says. He says, Ruya an Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam, Anna al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa salam, Sa'ala rabbahu, Subhanahu, meaning when the Messenger of Allah went to Mi'raj, Laylat al Mi'raj, Fakala, Ya Rabbi, Ayyil a'mal afdal. Which a'mal is afdal? Fakala Allah azza wa jal, Laysa shay'in indi afdal. No better a'mal is better than to have total trust in me. Meaning to have trust in me. And to be satisfied with what Allah gives you. To be happy with whatever you've been given. When you look in the mirror and look at the face that Allah has shaped you with, say Alhamdulillah. Allah ahsan al khaliqeen. Blessed is he who is the best of makers. I have been made this way. It's a blessing. That's what Allah chose me for. Be satisfied. Allah says an individual who lives that life is the best individual in, in the world. Tawakkal al Allah. There is much to say about tawakkal, but tawakkal doesn't come for free. It comes with trials. It comes with tribulations. It comes with the passions that we have. And we beg Allah to show us the value. And Allah takes it, shows us the value. Takes it, shows the value. And He gives us something better. And we may not be satisfied at first, but then we realize this is indeed better than what we had. And Allah says, I am the best of giver. And I'm giving you what is best for you. So live by tawakkal al Allah and die by tawakkal al Allah. If you look at Imam Hussain alayhi salam going to Karbala, Every movement is under tawakkal. And I tell you, if you have tawakkal, there is nothing else you need. When you want to take a step, you don't do it blindly. You ask, should I do this? You rationalize. You said, yes, it appears this is good. If I go here, it is a good thing to do. Allah is going to be pleased with me. Let's say I'm going to work and I'm going to do a transaction. I ask, is this transaction good? The question you ask, is Allah pleased with me? If I do this transaction, is my intent sincere? Is my desire pure? If it is, move. When you move, tawakkal al Allah. Even if there are problems, Allah moves it. 
Allah changes the affairs of those situations. Allah blocks things and Allah changes. You see? Allah says, Inna al hasanat yudhibna sayyat. Hasanat wipes off evil deeds. Here, even in action, you find Allah switches. Ya mubaddila sayyat bi adafiya min al hasanat. Imam Zain al Abidin says in this Haifa Sajjadiyah. And he's saying, O oh, one who switches, turns, but you and I need to move in that direction. So I'm making a very sincere cry to us all, including myself, that we need to indulge ourselves in the Quran, get solace and consolation, be happy, be positive, live a positive life, look up to the world that we have and fulfill our obligations. In Karbala, Imam Hussain as he is stranded in Karbala, being pushed to achieve Yazid's desires, but Imam has a better desire. If you look at the Imam's movement in Karbala, and you look at how history unveils itself, Yazid had a desire, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we wiped it. It was like a mirage in a desert, that when they placed their hands on that water, they saw nothing but Allah. This is how Imam Hussein was. He stood in front of them, and he says to them, that I am the one that Allah has chosen. I am the one that the Messenger of Allah appointed. Don't you remember? Don't forget that we are the ones authorized for your affairs on a day-to-day -day basis. Imam Hussain alayhi salam, while going to Karbala, took the women. These women, as I mentioned, the ones who are the banners, the flags of chastity, the ones who wear the hijab, the ones who went as the banner holders, Today, 14 centuries later, we're able to speak with such freedom and strength because of the women, because of Zainab alayhi salam, because of the women. If you read history, Rabab, Rabab was the wife of Imam Hussein. She comes back to Karbala, they say, and she pitched a tent where the massacre took place. And she used to sit in the tent and wait for the caravans to come by. And every time she would see a caravan, she'd call them. She would seat them and she would tell them what just happened. This is the power of women. They became the media of Karbala. They wear the flag today. Every time a woman comes in front of me with a hijab, she's telling me, Hassanain, be modest because that's the sign of a believer. Lower your eyes. You can look at me, but you better look at me the right way. Because that's my deen. The world doesn't like it, but we're blessed. Imam Hussein in Karbala had the wife of Imam Hassan say, Farwa was her name. Um Qasim, if you want to call her. The mother of Qasim ibn al Hassan. Qasim was a young boy. Young, handsome, young boy, look at a 12-year-old kid. Young, beautiful to look at. They say he was also a full shining moon, Qamar. They called him Qamar Bani Hashim also. He was the son of Imam Hassan, the youngest son. And he accompanied Imam Hussein in Karbala. Imam Hassan, as you know, passed away 10 years before. And Imam Hussein salam, took the custody of this child. And this child who came with him to Karbala. Now you can imagine this little boy having to witness the massacre taking place in front of his eyes. His father has been poisoned. He's become shaheed. The imam of his time taken away by Muawiyah. This young boy witnesses the massacre. Subhanallah. I tell you, brothers and sisters, when I see these young children, and I say, how does a young boy witness the massacre of Karbala at that level to have the strength to come and beg his uncle the permission to go forward to fight? Maybe he witnessed his two cousins, Aun and Muhammad. They were also very young. They were in their teens. Abdullah ibn Ja'far Tayyar, who was the Abdullah was the son of Ja'far, who was the brother of Imam Ali. 
was the husband of Zainab alayhi salam. And Abdullah remains behind in Medina to take care of the family affairs. So he is unable to go to Karbala. But instead he gives his two sons to Imam Hussein and says, my representatives are Aun and Muhammad, take them. And Zainab alayhi salam, who is the mother, she goes together with Imam Hussein in Karbala. So she is a witness to this entire massacre. She was standing by the tent, the window of the tent, and she watched all of these events take place. They say Aun comes and seeks permission from his mother. And Zainab alayhi salam, alayhi salam is proud to take her young son Aun and says, yes, I give you permission, go forward and protect the message of Allah and protect your imam. And Aun gets on a horse and Qasim probably was a witness to this. Qasim was probably a witness to see that these young boys donned a little armor for themselves in order to be able to go forward and to be able to sustain some damage on the enemy's side and to be a witness on judgment day that we stood for the truth. So they say Aun gets on the horse, Muhammad gets on the horse and they are fighting together, both supporting each other. But as time progresses, the enemy surrounds both of them and they are both inundated and both of them fall from their horses and both of them get killed with spear. One of them gets hit on the head with a very large object and they both fall shrieking as they say. They made the shrieking sound. Say, Ya Ammo, oh our uncle. We say, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Abu Abdullah al Hussein. You find that Imam Hussein watched these two nephews fall. He goes and picks them up and brings them back after they've been killed. But I tell you, there's so much tragedy when you see a young boy like Qasim, young, tender, that when you hold his hands, it's soft, tender, full of potential. He comes to his uncle and he pulls on his uncle's curb. He says, I'm, I want to go. How does a, an uncle who has taken who has taken responsibility of this young boy after having witnessed his brother killed how can he send him forward? Think about it brothers. This sacrifice of Imam Hussein is so supreme. It is so high that if I try to reflect on it it's just impossible. Some historians say that he delivers a little note to his uncle. This young boy delivers a little note and the Imam opens it. Some historians say that Imam Hassan is writing to his brother that there will come a time when you will be cornered and they will be massacring you. I won't be there to protect you. But oh my brother Hussein, this young son of mine, if he should ask you, give him permission to go. Can you imagine historians say that Qasim ibn al-Hasan didn't even have an armor. When he went on the battlefield, when Imam puts him on a horse, they say his strap, he was wearing a sandal. And historians noted that as he's moving towards the battlefield, the strap of his sandal was cut and it was marking the sand as he was being taken. It was to that level that his passion for the Imam was so much, his desire to give his life for the sake of Allah was so much that he begged the Imam unprepared to go as a witness that he has given his soul for the love of Allah. And they say, Qasim, as he's on the battlefield, as he's got this sword and as he's attacking the enemy, the men on the other side, the wretched mala'een, as they are looking at this young boy, they said, this is such a beautiful young boy coming to fight us. It's reached that level of pathetic state. That these enemies don't even have compassion that they start attacking this young boy. <laughs> this young boy turns around and he looks at them and there's a man, one mala'een whose name was Umar. Not the same Umar ibn Sa'ad, but this was also Umar ibn Sa'ad. He was one of the enemies. He comes and he strikes Qasim on the head. 
severely. And Qasim falls from the, from the horse. And as he falls, Imam Hussein sees this. And Imam Hussein comes charging towards them to save him. And in the onset, Imam cuts the arm of Amr, dismembers his arm. And the enemy comes forward and starts attacking. And this Amr's body gets trampled. Imam takes the little body of Qasim, which was now without a soul. <laughs> Little Qasim has passed away, has become shaheed. And Imam brings him back and places him among the rest of the dead bodies. Brothers and sisters, I want you to think of one more thing which is really sad to me. You find that Zainab salam, after having lost her two sons, Aun and Muhammad, when she returns to Medina, there is an image that is stuck in my heart that I must share with you. That when Zainab salam enters her home after Abdullah ibn Ja'far is looking at her, not recognizing her, when she goes into the room, she sees two musallas hanging on the wall. <laughs> that vision sticks in my heart. That these were two young boys who were also worshippers of Allah, that when they gave their lives, they were so pure. That we should beg that our children should like be like Onan Muhammad, that our children should be like Qasim ibn Hassan. Allah 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 Wa Sayyidah